Hi, I'm Louise Moffat, and this paper is on using interdisciplinary methodology to study late medieval churches in Ireland. So let me just share my screen. So this paper will discuss the forms of information available for late medieval churches in Ireland from both archaeological and documentary sources and the advantages of adopting such an interdisciplinary approach. It's, the paper is part of my PhD project, which examines how power and identity were negotiated and displayed in late medieval parish churches and their landscapes in the north of Ireland. This study focuses on the northern seven dioceses of the medieval ecclesiastical province of Armagh. So on the map, that will be Raffoe, Derry, Connor, Clocker, Armagh, Dromore and Down. And these are roughly equivalent to modern Northern Ireland, plus the counties of Donegal, Monaghan and Louth. This paper will show that combining archaeological and historical resources can not only aid with dating churches and determining their usage and whether they were a parish church or a chapel, but can open new avenues of research into issues such as church patronage and local and regional economies. So as said, this paper is based on the methodology of my PhD project, which is a regional study of the north of Ireland to explore negotiations of power and identity within late medieval parish churches and their landscapes. This will be investigating the local parish churches within the wider socio-political landscape, looking at where the churches are built in the local landscapes, the wealth of the churches, who the patrons of the churches were, were possible, and whether the wealth and patronage of the churches is visible in surviving ruins and in the structure of the local landscape. The study area of the Northern Diocese was divided in the late medieval period politically, with eastern areas, particularly Connor and Down, brought into the Anglo-Norman colony, and western regions remaining under Gaelic lords. This enables us to compare the situation of local churches within these two different polities and assess the similarities and differences in the use and treatment of local churches in each. Now, using this interdisciplinary methodology and the landscape approach to churches is relatively new in Irish archaeology. It's really only in the last 20 years that church research has moved beyond looking at the church building in isolation or as part of an architectural study to considering the church in its wider landscape context and using different sources of data available. I'm focusing on the north of Ireland for a regional study because it has been neglected in previous church studies up to this point, with the exception of Anne Hammond's work in, on the early medieval church. And despite there being good primary sources for churches in the north in both archaeology and history, very little of the pioneering interdisciplinary work in Ireland has looked at this region. Duffy has covered parish formation and the shape of the parish, particularly in Clocker diocese, and Jeffreys has looked at parishes and pastoral care in the early Tudor era. But I want to look at the role of the church in its locality in the middle centuries, the 1200s to the 1400s, looking at the local population, the local lord and the local economy and how these all related to the local church. My methodology is based in part on the Making Christian Landscapes project, published a few years ago by O'Carrigan and Turner. They focus on the landscape perspective and their work incorporates data from different sources, both archaeological and documentary. In addition, they actively highlight and advocate the use of interdisciplinary methodology to study early medieval churches. Gleason and de Cargan, for example, incorporate genealogical evidence in their research of churches in what was the Ephelan Kingdom, which is roughly the County Kildare area, to identify church and land ownership. This early medieval church research is a prime example of the potential new research areas to investigate in church studies using this interdisciplinary methodology. But this has not been replicated for late medieval churches. So let me take you now to the north of Ireland in the late medieval period, by which I mean roughly 1200 to 1500 AD. First, let me give you an overview of some of the main archaeological and historical sources we have for late medieval churches. Combining these sources for a regional study does involve a number of different databases and documents. 
From the archaeological side, the most accessible sources are the Sites and Monuments records for Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Both the Northern Ireland Sites and Monuments record and the Archaeological Survey of Ireland databases provide locational information where possible and the site description of each monument recorded. It has to be said, the detail of these descriptions does vary depending on who recorded the site, when it was recorded, how much the site has been researched and so on. But from these descriptions, we can identify probable and possible late medieval church sites in the relevant counties in the north of Ireland. So probable church sites are those with good physical evidence for the presence of a late medieval church or chapel. Possible are those with potential archaeological remains that have not yet been fully identified or with folk tradition or an antiquarian reference to a church site. As you can see from the table, some counties have more church sites recorded for them than others, and some have more church sites that are firmly identified as church sites, whereas others have more church sites that are possible based just on references or haven't had enough work done on them yet. If we translate these counties into their medieval diocesan equivalents, again you can see there's a variety of numbers. Some dioceses have more churches recorded than others, and with some this makes sense. Armagh was a larger diocese at the time, so it makes sense for it to have more churches. But as you can see, there are a good number of churches for each diocese, both based on archaeological remains for both probable and possible. The condition of the surviving church ruins varies greatly in the north, from almost intact roofless ruins, such as Cranfield Old Church in Antrim, which is on the north shore of Loch Ney, or Hollywood Priory in Belfast, to walls that are very ivy covered, such as Mullaglass Church in Armagh, or churches with only fragmentary remains of walls or foundational courses, such as Dunbow Church on the north coast. Ruins with surviving architectural features, particularly doors, windows, can be dated and their phases of construction identified. And the best example of this is probably Banneker Old Church in Londonderry. The architectural styles of the windows and the door there demonstrate that the main body of the church, the western nave, was constructed in the 12th century. And you can see the door is of a 12th century architectural style. We then have the eastern chancel added in approximately 1210 to 1225, and this window is of the Romanesque Gothic transitional phase of architecture, which dates it fairly specifically to those dates. For every church with good architectural remains that can be dated, however, there is another featureless ruin that can at best be classed as late medieval. There are also a significant number of church sites with very little or no upstanding remains of a building. This is one of the issues that my interdisciplinary approach can help with. Documentary sources often record for us that a particular church was in use and had a rector or a vicar or was vacant in a certain year. So this is one area where archaeology and history can really complement each other and help each other out. Now there are several documentary sources for medieval churches in the north of Ireland. The main ones are the 1306 Ecclesiastical Taxation, the Orma Registers, Colton's Visitation of Derry and the Anatus Hiberniae, which is a collection of 15th and early 16th century taxation records. Others that can be used are the Irish Annals, such as the Annals of Ulster and the Papal of Registers, although these two have fewer benefits for the amount of effort it takes to find churches within them. Neither of these were created specifically for Irish churches, so the amount of effort required to find these small details make them a little less useful. Colton's visitation is very useful for the Diocese of Derry, but because it was created specifically for that diocese, it is limited to those churches only. So the taxation records and the armor registers are the best sources for studying the overall region of the north of Ireland. In terms of dating, as you can see, the ecclesiastical taxation is the earliest from the early 14th century. The armor registers are from different archbishops and span an overall date range of 1361 to 1513 for the medieval period. And the Anatas Hiberniae contains records from approximately 1400 to 1535 AD. 
that the initial information we can take from some of these, particularly the 1306 taxation, is the taxable wealth of each church in existence in the early 14th century. It also, of course, identifies which churches are in use at this time, and from this we can extrapolate that these churches were most likely in use in the later 13th century as well. What this can really help us with is in some cases to identify the continuity of pre-12th century church sites into the later medieval period, so we can see continuity from early medieval churches to late medieval churches. For example, the churches of St John's Point and Rahul Bull Church or St Tassocks, which is the one pictured here, are both early medieval in date from their architectural remains. Their presence in the 1306 taxation, however, imply their continued usage into the 14th century, with some level of taxable wealth suggesting they were still using parishioners. We have Rahul also mentioned in the registers of Archbishop Sweetman, which date from the 1360s. So we have this church in continuation up until the later 14th century for definite. Moreover, the combination of no further documentary references beyond the later 14th century and the lack of alterations to the church buildings infers that these churches may have fallen out of use or served as smaller chapels for those unable to attend the main parish church. So we have here the continuity of early medieval churches into the first bit of the later medieval period, but then either falling out of use or being downgraded to chapels. This is where the archaeological survey and the documentary sources work well in tandem to answer the question of when churches were in use and was there continuity from early medieval to late medieval. I'd like to finish with two case studies to further illustrate the benefits of this interdisciplinary methodology and the research directions that can be opened up as a result. The first concerns the church of Ballywillan, which is on the outskirts of Port Rush at the north coast. The medieval church is a well-preserved roofless ruin, although the interior is now occupied by modern burials. There is a door in the north wall, three open windows and four blocked windows. The architectural evidence of some of the windows indicates that they were lancet windows in construction, which suggests that the church was originally built in the 13th century. This church is also recorded in the 1306 taxation in the Diocese of Connor as Port Roska with a value of 25 pounds, four shillings and eight pence. To place this in context, there are only two other churches in the same deanery as this church with a higher valuation. Moreover, the churches with the next highest valuations after Ballywillan are valued between eight and 11 pounds. This church is valued at over twice as much. It is also the only church of the three wealthiest churches in that deanery to have surviving architectural remains. And we can see some of the evidence of this greater wealth in the archaeology. If we compare this church building to other surviving ruins in counties Londonderry and Antrim, for example, Ballywillan is both the largest church building by ground floor area and has the greatest number of windows. We can also see in the east wall, in the image here of the east window, that originally it was a series of lancet windows. You can see the remains of the arch of one of the lancet windows on the edge of the current window. But we have the evidence that this window was then changed to make a larger window in the east wall, probably dating to the 15th and 16th century and originally containing tracery. This east end work suggests that there was both the desire and the means to keep the church building up to date with the latest architectural fashions. And thus, that the wealth inferred from the 1306 taxation continued, to some extent at least, through the later medieval period. How this church came to possess much greater wealth than many of its neighbours still requires a lot of investigation, but the point here is really to highlight that with this example we have agreement between the archaeology and documentary sources of an unusually large and wealthy parish church, which can then lead us to look into issues in this locality such as economy, church patronage and local population. The issue of church patronage leads me to my second case study, which is much more theoretical at this stage. If you read some of the church archaeology literature from England, such as Everson and Stocker's work on Lincolnshire, they've done a lot of research on secular patronage of churches by local lords. If we come back to the north of Ireland, 
we can take the example of John de Courcy founding monasteries at Inch and Grey Abbey. Now there has been much less research into the patronage of local churches in Ireland, but the situation elsewhere would suggest that local lords were the pat patrons of their local churches. Except if we look at some of the documentary evidence, we find that this is not always the case. Let me give you a brief example. In Octavian de Palacio's register, which dates from 1478 to 1513, several parish churches are recorded as under the patronage of Comain and Priory. We also have references in the registers to secular lords as patrons of churches, with the rights to nominate the priest and so on. So here, there is the potential to take the evidence of patronage from the documentary sources out to the archaeological evidence to try and identify how different forms of patronage were realised in the physical church building and its landscape. Are there differences in how secular and ecclesiastical patrons treat the parish churches under the control? Do you either provide the means of updating the church architecture? Are they building churches in the same places in the landscape or are they building them in different places? Do the secular lords, for example, build their churches near to their own residences? Or are they building them further away? And where are the ecclesiastical patrons building the churches? So these are just some of the questions that we can ask of the archaeological evidence based on what we have in the documentary sources. To conclude then, this paper has shown that interdisciplinary methodology has great potential to further the study of late medieval parish churches in Ireland. The variety of documentary sources available in the North complement the archaeological record and provide different forms of information, which enables new lines of inquiry, such as the issue of church patronage. It can feed also into broader research of local and regional societies and communities, thus furthering our understanding of medieval Ireland. And thank you for listening. I'm very happy to take any questions you may have.